hi everybody. Uh, yep, my name is Ali Abbasi and I'm a PhD student at the University of Twente in the Netherlands and a visiting researcher at Chair of System Security of Ruhr University Bochum in Germany. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a microshield, uh, uh, a control flow integrity protection mechanism for uh, binaries of the PLCs. I also talk about uh, a new research which recently got accepted uh, and will be presented uh, later uh, this year in the US, uh, which is a protection mechanism for uh, a hard real-time PLCs. So uh, let's start by looking at uh, binary security and importance of it, and especially memory corruption, which is a topic which I work and most of my PhD thesis is about it. Uh, actually, uh, memory corruption is actually common in embedded systems generally and also uh, a large portion of uh, industrial control system devices. And it's a not, not, not a surprising fact because uh, most of the uh, embedded software development is actually dominated by C program, which is not a safe language. And, uh, and beside that, we also have like 10, 10 15 percent uh, C++ programs which are uh, also not type safe. So it's not a surprising thing. And actually, this is the picture, which first time we are showing, uh, based on the data from ICS CERT, a number of devices affected by memory corruption vulnerabilities uh, in the last seven years. And as you can see, in 2010, we didn't have any kind of embedded device, or like embedded control device, as we say. Uh, which were affected by memory corruption. But it's increasing, and it will be much more. Uh, so in the PLCs and other embedded control systems, the, the, the explo exploitation scenarios which we have is like, is not, the, com there is no complexity on finding the vulnerabilities inside uh, embedded control system. They are usually lag behind. Uh, general purpose computers. It's not as complex as finding exploits in a Microsoft Edge browser or like Google Chrome. But uh, the problem is something else. The problem is that getting access to these devices and uh, because they usually have unusual hardware or software, so you have less understanding of uh, how they are internally working. So you cannot get access to it because, for example, lots of vendors also uh, encrypt or sometimes obfuscate their firmware. So you have no idea what's going on inside. So that's the problem. The problem is not the, the vulnerability complexity. And once the attacker can get, uh, to get, get past this stage, which takes some time, but once uh, the attacker gets familiar with it, then there is no problem with that. Um, the exploits which attacker can generate have a long uh, uh, shelf life, actually. So, because of this exploitation scenario, in general purpose computers, uh, there are lots of exploit mitigations so for buffer overflow attacks. So yeah, if uh, in the old times uh, you could just buy a, having a buffer overflow lead you to a shell, it's not a, a, any more like that. So uh, you have to now find an info leak to, find, to bypass the address space layout randomization. And also, uh, you need to have a rope payload to uh, construct a, uh, uh, well, basically bypass data execution prevention or X and bit, uh, and then of course sometimes in the browser cases you have also sandboxes which you have to escape. Then you get the shell. So, <clears throat> so in the old time, so it, it's the same time for attackers. So attackers didn't stand still. So uh, in the old time again, so you could the attacker were just jumping to its shell code. And that was it. Now the attacker actually doing, uh, taking a different approach. So he's actually uh, constructing a return-oriented programming payload. So if before you were just putting your code in, into the shell code, uh, now you are actually construct. You can also construct your shell codes from the existing codes within the application by just return and jumping, keep returning to piece of your code. So in this example, if you wanted to, uh, for example, having a move EAX ECX. Uh, so what you are doing is that you find somewhere with this instruction and then return. Then go to the next instruction. Let's say you wanted to have add EAX EV. So just constructing everything you wanted as instructions uh, by each jump. 
So basically what you do is that you're hijacking the control flow of the application. But there are some problems, especially for embedded, system, embedded control systems. Uh, uh, first of all is that uh, the explo exploit mitigation, if we want to bring exploit mitigation, they require redesigning of entire operating system. Uh, uh, some months ago in S4 Europe, I, I actually talked about uh, exploit mitigations in embedded systems and uh, how they are lagging behind. But that's not the only problem. The other problem is that um, uh, traditional mitigation, which we talked about, the uh, ASLR, data execution prevention, are not enough because the attackers also found ways to bypass them. That's why there are some more advanced mitigations, uh, <clears throat> at least in general purpose computers. So uh, now, for example, uh, new modern operating systems or, for example, uh, uh, Linux, hardened Linux with like, uh, like packs, they are actually introducing a concept of control flow integrity. So I just want to just basically say what is control flow integrity because the talk uh, is about that. Is that let's assume that you have multiple functions inside your PLC binary. And these multiple functions, let's call them A, B, C, D, E. They're, when you monitor the, their behavior, they are actually following certain paths. So function A always call function B, but it never calls function E. That's where we are actually looking at. So we are saying, OK, if a basic block, a function, actually suddenly jump to E while we never seen this behavior before, this is something suspicious. So usually a control flow hijacking attack is happening. That's where we actually introduce MicroShield. Uh, it's an open source. Uh, already available in GitHub uh, for uh, binaries of embedded control systems. So it's not only for PLCs, but for all other embedded control systems. And it's configurable, meaning that you can have different levels of protections. <clears throat> so what it will detect? Well, if you have uh, basic memory corruption <clears throat> or any kind of uh, uh, return-oriented programming, so return-oriented programming, jump-oriented programming, or call-oriented programming, let's say XOP, we call it, uh, any kind of uh, X-oriented programming, uh, it can detect. So it has three components. First component is uh, basically a setup, uh, uh, setup part, which basically a scan your binary uh, and tell you whether it can deploy a protection mechanism uh, in your PLC or not, or in other embedded control devices you have, or any other embedded software. <clears throat> then we have a very extreme light uh, protection system in the kernel. So this is the case when you have um, access to insert kernel module to, to the uh, control device. And it's really, really basic. So basically, it induces like really around 1% overhead or less. And it also have a coarse grain uh, backward edge control flow integrity. And also, it have certain behavior-based heuristics and also some syscall sandboxes and also uh, file system access sandboxes. So if attacker somehow want to access to some specific sensitive file, it raise alert. And then the last part, which is much more heavier, but is much more uh, uh, <coughs> accurate protection mechanism. So it's uh, around 6% overhead. And basically what it does is that it's, it's, uh, it, it is a fine-grained backward edge control flow integrity and uh, uh, coarse-grained uh, forward edge control flow integrity. Forward edge here means uh, code pointer calls, so indirect function calls. And uh, basically what we do is that we have the embedded application and there are certain parts of the application. So for example, if there is a return happening at the end, end of the function or if there is an indirect function call happening inside the application, we put a specific, we re replace an instruction before that call happens and we insert a jump. And then we jump to our, our uh, basically what we call trampoline technique. Uh, jump to our code and execute our checking mechanisms and then return back uh, to the jump. So before the jump happens, we check whether it's valid jump or not. Or before its return happens, we check whether it's, uh, the program jumping to somewhere 
uh, right or not. So the, the point here is that assume that you have a PLC or other embedded softwares uh, or embedded control softwares which um, have a memory corruption, but we don't know about it. So it's a, let's say, zero day, nobody knows about it. A control flow integrity actually can <laughs> block that kind of attacks, which we don't know about them yet. So, so as we said, we are actually uh, putting our monitoring in function prolog, also in a uh, function epilog, meaning that at the beginning of the function, we check the return address, and at the end of the function, um, we check if the return address is the same return address which was expected. And also for code pointers, we do the same. So uh, basically, <clears throat> this is a regular function you see in the, in the left side, and then you see that uh, the function gets instrumented by rewriting the binary, and uh, now it's actually <clears throat> check, uh, for example, for shadow stacks, see if the var values change during the return or code pointer call. Also, we generate a control flow graph, uh, which is basically the right path which a program has to take. We use two approaches. Uh, first of all, is using a symbolic execution. It's called Anger, it's famous. And uh, for generating a control flow graph, also we developed an IDA Pro plugin uh, to generate a control flow graph. So now I actually uh, brought a, a Pi to just show you um, how actually we are going to um, detect uh, a memory corruption uh, within a vulnerable mode bus server. So I run, uh, so basically we have two components, a kernel module or kernel protection module and a runtime protection module, as, as we said. So for kernel protection module, I have to, uh, uh, oops, keyword doesn't work. Okay, let me just reset the pi. Maybe that helps. Okay, so in the exploitation scenario, uh, what we are going to do is that we are going to create a file in TM slash TMP folder using a memory corruption, a buffer or flow attack. So there is no file currently in the TMP folder. Oops. Don't know why I can't see it. Let's just try it from here. All right, um, so what I'm doing is at first, I'm going to insert uh, 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 my kernel protection module to the kernel. And uh, so as we can see now, in the kernel, uh, we have a shield core running. And the next step is that I'm going to run um, basically uh, my runtime protection module, which is basically uh, a shared library loading with our Modbus server. So, 
So here is our um, shared library, and here is a patched Modbus server, a uh, dummy server. So now the runtime protection module is running. And uh, let me just go back. So uh, as we said, in our exploitation case, uh, we create a file in the TMP folder by exploiting a memory corruption in a Modbus TCP server. And uh, also I take a look at if my Modbus server is running. As we can see here, a Modbus server is running in port 1502. Uh, right now, we have two, uh, two configuration in, the, in our protection system. One is that if we find a memory corruption happening, we kill the process. Another configuration is that we just raise the alert, send the alert to a syslog server. Right now, in this demo which I'm showing to you, it's set to um, uh, basically uh, kill the process. So now I'm, uh, again, my network keep getting disconnected. So I'm going to, uh, from my machine here, sending, communicating with the Modbus TCP server I have. So here is a dummy client for Modbus, and I'm talking with the Modbus client. And in the other side, you can see that the Modbus client is answering, keep answering to my dummy client responses. So let's just kill it and to stop here. So because the connection, uh, the, the user ended its connection. So now I'm actually using my exploits uh, to exploit the Modbus TCP server. So here, I'm putting the IP address of the target, and I'm saying that, hey, I want, for example, create a, a TMP file called pound. And I'm sending my exploit. I sent the exploit, and let's look at here. So as we can see, uh, MicroShield kick in. And notice about uh, runtime protection module, or RPM, notice that there is a buffer workflow happening. This is a buffer workflow which we don't know about it. So it's a kind of like, let's say, zero day, we don't know anything about it. And uh, the microshield could actually detect it. Let's run it again. I want to um, again show something. So now, this time, I'm uh, also uh, it's exploited again and see again if it's working. So this time, I'm going to create file pound2. Send the payload, and again, MicroShield kill the process because it's noticed that there is a buffer overflow happening in a Modbus TCP server. So before the attacker can infect the machine, uh, we stopped it. And of course, we can actually look at the lock which generated by uh, MicroShield. So we can see that there is a error, and actually, we, we actually say that this is the expected address uh, which we expected to happen, but this is the manipulation of the address. So the attacker was jumping somewhere in libc to create his uh, return-oriented programming payload, which we stopped it from happening. And also, uh, in the same time, we can actually see uh, that uh, MicroShield in the kernel protection module also generated lots of logs saying that, hey, uh, there was an attack. So, uh, so also kernel module also detected the vulnerability, both KPM and RPM at the same time. <clears throat> Let's go back to presentation. So <clears throat> the source code is available from MicroShield in uh, GitHub. So next is that uh, this is something that I wasn't supposed to talk about it, but I changed a little bit my presentation to <clears throat> add time for that. It's a, 
uh, another poor section system, but this time for hard real-time PLCs. Not just PLCs, but also any kind of, uh, for example, avionic system also. Uh, you can actually protect them. So uh, there is a difference between real-timeness and non-real-time devices, and it's that you have to guarantee that a, ta a specific task will finish at a specific time. And there are different levels of real-timeness, but what we were working on was hard real-time, which is the most, the hardest part of real-time systems, so like uh, a protection system which guarantees that it never um, uh, have a delay for its application. So uh, that's where ECFI coming. So basically, this one is not binary-based for uh, commercial off-the-shelf binaries. It's actually compiler-based. And uh, what we do is that, so in our implementation for ARM, uh, we transform the, the, bind, the, the source code to assembly, and we only need the assembly uh, compiled code. And then we uh, inject our monitoring codes, and then we have a modified application, and then here is the point in our protection system, which is a ring buffer. And uh, runtime monitoring always read the ring buffer. And here is where we actually uh, monitor. Uh, so let's say we have an indirect function call, uh, you can see with the BLX regex, which is BLX in ARM assembly means that uh, usually being used for indirect function calls. So you can see that right before the BLX, we are actually putting another instrumentation code which copy the address which the regex have and uh, to a ring buffer. And also again, uh, before, uh, for example, BXLR, the last instruction in original ARM application, we actually modify it with um, uh, uh, <coughs> by adding a new instruction right before it. And this is how the ring buffer is basically working, is that uh, you are keep copying the data uh, before uh, the jump happens. And uh, yeah, and then the, there is another separated process, which is reading the data. So to understand it better, that's how it's working. So <coughs> uh, R stands for read, so a checker application which write, reading the data. And W stands for uh, write. It means that uh, a real-time, hard real-time application keep writing to the ring buffer. And as you can see, you have an application which is high real-time. And then there is a CFG verification or control flow verification, which is running flexibly. And uh, so what is happening is that the CFG check have to wait always. And here is working. So the, uh, the, the, the real-time application keep writing to the ring buffer the control flow data. But the <coughs> checker application, which is here stand by with the R, we're showing it, it have to wait because there is no resources. Once the resource becomes available, so before the resource, like a UCP usage was 100%, there was no resources. Once it become available, then the checker application kick in and read the content of the data, you know, which is control flow data. And eventually, that's how it's working. So we, we verify. Uh, that uh, we do not violate uh, hard real-timeness of the system. And also, there were some kind of attacks. We actually thought about it's what if attacker DOS our system, so we will not have any resources. And also for that, we developed uh, uh, some system which we are using a performance monitoring unit of the CPU for detecting uh, overrides of the ring buffer. Uh, the entire design of this system is based on uh, real-timeness, hard real-timeness, and uh, there is no priority inversion, there is no, uh, uh, there is no locking over the ring buffer, which we have, and, uh, and it's, uh, well, actually, we use the avionic systems uh, softwares for verification of worst-case execution time of our instrumentation code uh, uh, to, to guarantee that there is, uh, uh, there is no, uh, violation of real timeness of the system. So, and also the paper is already published. Uh, we didn't yet present it in the conference, but, uh, but and today it's just the introduction. I didn't uh, the, discuss in detail about our work, but uh, the paper is public now. Also for MicroShield, both of them, the paper with details, like 15, 16 pages, uh, are there. And I think we need more system security. Four PLCs, actually, uh, in lower level. It's a race to the bottom, as I say always. And, uh, and I think the memory corruption vulnerabilities will be problematic for programming logic controllers and other embedded control devices, switches, network switches, which you are using. Um, 
And then we also have other problems such as lack of secure boot chain. Some PRC vendors already started to deploy such thing, but uh, uh, if we don't have this chain of secure or defense in depth, then we will have more problems. If you have any question now. Thank you. Let's give Ali a warm applause to begin with. And uh, are you ready to shoot some quick questions? Yeah, sure. So how does your approach help against unchanged default passwords? Oh, that doesn't. So the, we are in academia, so we are not thinking about the problem which you have right now. And that's mm -hmm. something that's already solved and there is a solution. We are thinking about this, the problems which we are facing in the next 10 years. And that's where we are developing such thing. And it takes time until vendors catch up and actually deploy. So you think that we will get rid of default passwords in 10 years? No, time? because no, okay. as we heard yesterday night, what we need is a patch. We don't have a patch for human stupidity, so. OK. <laughs> Does Ushield inject trampoline checks for each function call? How can this only add 1 to 6% overhead? So uh, yes, we actually only uh, inject it for not for each function call, but also for every return address. So the 1% overhead is for kernel protection module. It's open source, so you can actually try it by yourself. <laughs> uh, and yes, it's uh, around 6% overhead. There is a full details of, there are some cases, specific cases, uh, which uh, it might uh, induce more performance overhead, for example, 10% uh, to 12%. But that's a very, very rare case. Uh, uh, most of the time, we use lots of benchmarking, again, as I said. Uh, if you just search the name of my talk in uh, Google Scholar, you can also find the full details of all performance, performance results of the work. But in 99% of the cases, uh, actually, we are around 5% overhead for runtime protection module. OK. Uh, what prevents an exploit from taking advantage of your syscall hooks that execute in kernel space? Now we're really getting into details here. Mm, yeah? That's fine. <laughs> uh, so first of all, the exploitation have to happen first infect the machine and then uh, do the other steps for, for example, kernel hooks and stuff. So what we are assuming is that uh, we actually in, like, uh, stop the attacker before actually he comes in and exploit uh, the system. So that's the, uh, the assumption which we have. So with the runtime protection module which we have, uh, we can actually detect it before the attacker comes in to the system. And then once he's inside, then yes, he can attack the kernel. Of course, there are cases, for example, when the PLC, there are some actually famous vendors which are actually using unikernel uh, kind of uh, implementation, which there is no kernel space, user space separation. And then, yes, uh, that's an open problem right now. We are actually working, and we have some projects about that as well. So OK, I think we have to finish by that. And thank you very much. Here's a thanks. token of appreciation. Yep. And <laughs> thanks. thanks a lot.